No, 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 no. Plowing through a high street in a truck, killing women and children, that is horrible. This is payback. Fair dues. That guy ruined countless lives, all from people who just wanted a shag. I'm only sorry I couldn't see his face while I was giving him a tow through the desert. And if you can't see that, that is your problem, not mine. I saw Diana dying, this close to my face. They took a saw to my family, Dad. A guy with a saw chased Kate. Fuck these people. Fuck them and their smug superiority, their hypocrisy, their violence sanctioned by a bunch of geriatric fuckers on a religious power trip. Fuck them all. Dad said nothing. I saw him breathing in and out, twice, very controlled. I don't know much about Sharia law, but I wouldn't conduct my own defense if I were you. Is there anything you want me to say to anyone? Yes, to all the girls and mum, that I love them, and that, that I'm sorry. I'm sorry this happened. I planned it carefully, and I don't know what went wrong. And to you, thanks for coming. Sorry I yelled at you. And to Caroline, tell her to recover my laptop and decrypt it. It's in storage here with my luggage. My IT guys will know the password. It's the one we use for master backups. There's information on it MI6 will want to have. I recorded the interrogation. There are a few notes as well. Make sure you get it. I wasn't able to upload it all. But some of it? Yes, but not... I did upload something, but that's just a confession I made him read. Rough edit. Needs a bit of work. It's not on a public server. Now, don't go before they come get you. Turn that thing off and tell me about Edwin. I know you've been seeing him every day, so I want to hear everything. Absolutely everything. Even what I already know. Well, he's... <sighs> Dad sighed. Martin, why are you so calm? This is... This can't be anything but the end for you. I drank some more water. You know, I'm not so sure it is. Really? You're not sure? You killed more people than Philip Morris? Interesting observation for someone who smokes to this day. But the thing is, I've only been detained. There has been no interrogation. You'd think that, given what I did, I'd have been tied up with the lamp pointed at my face from the moment they captured me, but they haven't. And when I presented myself at the airport and checked in, no alarms went off. I walked underneath a bunch of cameras as I entered the departures hall. My luggage was barely looked at during a security screening. I presented my passport at check-in and they labelled my bags. That's weird, isn't it? Things only went pear-shaped after I went through passport control. You'd think they'd be all over me, trying to find out if I had an accomplice. But basically I've been left alone since processing and detained with other prisoners. So yeah, I'm not too worried. Massively inconvenienced, certainly, but not overly worried. Perhaps you could alert Asim. He might be able to tell you more. Dad nodded. I'm sure Caroline will be able to reach him. I take it he doesn't know what you've been up to. I shrugged. Maybe he's pieced it together, but in that case it's too late anyway. But for now, tell me about Edwin, and don't stop until they come knocking, OK? And turn that thing off, it's driving me mental. Fifteen minutes later, I shook my father's hand, trying very hard not to fall apart. Yes, of course that happened. I was in prison, and I'd just been talking about my son. How could it not? He was better at handling it than me, it must be said. Which was good, because it's weird if the man from the embassy starts to blubber when he leaves. Two disinterested guards waited in the doorway. Goodbye, Mr. Edgbaston. Thank you for your time. Good luck, Mr. Carstairs. And just so you know, we're all proud of you. Mistakes were made, but even so, very, very proud. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you, sir. If you recall, in my previous journal, I asked you to imagine a Saudi border control post, and you were spectacularly wrong. You came up with this horrible cliché based on what Hollywood thinks a Bolivian passport office looks like, including a fly-specked fan with strings. Turns out it looks more like a pharmacy than anything else, or a car rental station. So, round two. Saudi prisons. What are they like? I'll give you a few minutes while I tell you what happened just after I was stopped at the airport. 
I was made to sit on my knees and then handcuffed in full view of other passengers going through passport control. Obviously, all of them looked the other way. I was taken into an office, searched very thoroughly, and then they demanded that I boot my laptop. I did, using the method that only gained them access to a barely used Windows installation. That seemed to be enough. I was made to sit on a chair for half an hour, during which a number of phone calls were made. I could actually see my flight boarding and the gate closing through the shutters of the office I was in. My bag was taken from the plane, or rather from the baggage train, and brought in. They searched it in front of me and found the medallion I was given by Mr. Mohammed to identify myself as a somewhat high-ranking staff member of the royal family. That raised some eyebrows, but it didn't change anything. A senior officer who spoke English then came up to me. Obviously, I wasn't feeling very optimistic about the future at that point, but I think I managed to hide it quite well. You will be taken to a cell, he announced. May I ask what the problem is? Your name is on the list, that's all I know. Excuse me, what list is that exactly? The list of people who are to be arrested and taken to prison when they try to leave the country. We will inform the British Embassy and the Ministry of Civil Service. Now be quiet and don't get up from that chair. So, Saudi prisons. Maybe you googled it when I wasn't looking. You seem the type, frankly. You'll have found many accounts of torture and of sexual abuse when it comes to female prisoners, especially those protesting for equality, which is a very easy way to get incarcerated. You may also have seen the footage of one prisoner who was hung upside down by other inmates and savagely beaten as prison officers looked on. Which, in and of itself, isn't saying much. If someone shat in my bed, I'd do exactly the same to him. There's also plenty of evidence of torture by the state, and more than one activist has been taken to hospital, mentally destroyed and covered in burns from electroshock torture. There are about 61,000 prisoners within Saudi Arabia. Half of them are Saudi nationals, and 90% are men. Whether or not the incarceration rate is low or high depends on your perspective. 197 prisoners per 100,000 people. Land of the free, 655. Canada, 114. Netherlands, 61. But half of those detained haven't had their day in court yet. Not that it matters much in countries like that, obviously. As in all prisons worldwide, mental issues affect a large percentage of inmates, so there is a thriving black market for medication, or at least for whatever helps you to dull the misery. Alcohol isn't an option, because even detained Muslims still maintain a certain amount of hypocrisy. But hashish, as it's called locally, is very much in demand, as are all kinds of psychotropic medication, cigarettes and food. Yes, food. Some prisoners at the bottom of the food chain have come close to starvation. Money is a bit of a problem, as it's taken away when you are processed. You can get it back after a few days, but you do get a receipt with the amount, which you can show to other inmates for credit. And you'll have to, because you'll have to pay for everything. This all sounds very bad. But don't worry, just make sure you're convicted for terrorism. Suddenly, it's a whole different kettle of fish. You'll go to the al Hair high-security prison in Riyadh. It's still a prison, but much less crowded. There are still guard towers with machine guns, and you will share a cell with six to eight people, but cell doors are mostly not locked, and you can spend the day chatting, playing chess, or watching TV. Conjugal visits are possible in a hotel-like wing of the prison, where you and the missus get some privacy in a carpeted room with a fridge, a telly, and your own shower. And a bed, obviously. You can attend weddings and funerals in the outside world, and you'll even be given a few thousand dollars to present to the happy couple. Yes, thousand. Your family is put on welfare while you are incarcerated, and your kids can come and play with you. If they don't live nearby, the government will pay for airfare and hotel costs. Isn't that lovely? Just be sure to be a proper terrorist, not some poor dope incarcerated for a PDA, that's a public display of affection, a big no-no, celebrating your birthday or Valentine's Day, 
criticizing the government or the restrictions placed on individual freedom by Islam or said government, taking pictures of a royal palace, showing your knees or shoulders, even as a man, wearing tight jeans or dining in the family section of a restaurant as a bachelor. That will get you sent to one of the less pleasant prisons. But if you were stopped on your way to join IS, the Islamic State, to do some beheading, al Hayr is where you'll go. Now, if ever there was a suitable candidate for terrorist prison, I'm sure you'll agree that was me. But at that time I didn't know about al Hayr, and even if I had, I don't think I would have mentioned my qualifications. Nobody else had so far. And so I said nothing, which I would also have done if I had been detained in any other country. An hour after my plane had left, I was given the chance to use the toilet. I felt that might be a good decision, even if the experience wasn't very private. I was then put into the back of a white van with a guard, and found myself driving through Riyadh at night. A very familiar experience. I could see out of the rear window and was pretty sure KT was two cars behind us at one point. Sadly, my watch had been taken away, as had my phone, so perhaps it wasn't KT, as she had no way of tracking me. I was taken to Riyadh Expat Prison, which doesn't really look like any prison you'll have seen on TV. No central courtyard, no towers with armed guards. It's where anyone with any kind of visa problem gets sent, plus those whose visa is about to be cancelled for breaking the law. It's not so much populated by murderers as by Pakistani and Indians who overstate their visa, although you shouldn't think of this as a pleasant waiting room filled with people whose only crime is having been a bit careless with their paperwork. It's a prison, and there are many reasons, including a few legitimate ones, people end up there smuggling drugs or alcohol, stealing, lewd behavior and acts of violence were also quite common charges. But this wasn't a high-security prison, as I was told it. You could have fooled me, though. The van passed through an entry gate, was locked in during an inspection, and then another gate opened. The officer removed my restraints, which had been fastened in front of me during the ride. I was ordered to leave the van and had to carry my own luggage. Then I went through processing by myself, as the only new arrival for this evening. The officer who did that grudgingly spoke English when it turned out I understood next to nothing of his Arab dialect. You see, I was used to hanging out with royalty, and as anywhere else, they speak in a very specific way. Mind you, there are local accents from the Netherlands I can't even understand, so this wasn't all that strange. I feared a strip search but for some blessed reason they were not at all interested in what I might have up my bum. Obviously, I had nothing secreted there, and for the record, I never have, but perhaps that would only have caused them to probe deeper. My belt had already been taken away at the airport, and now they wanted my shoelaces. After that, in a very thorough pat-down, I was taken to a solitary cell with a thin mattress that, in the dim glow of a light fixture embedded in the ceiling, at least, didn't seem particularly dirty. I'd have liked a pillow and a blanket, but you know me, I hate to be a bother. There was also a black plastic bucket for my convenience. I was glad I gave at the airport, but this would probably be the way to go in the future. This, or worse. Oh, if only I'd known what was in store for me in that regard. Although I'm describing all this very matter-of-factly, I obviously went nearly insane with fear from the moment they nabbed me. Given what I'd done, even a secret ten-minute trial, not very unusual in what Saudi Arabia without a hint of sarcasm calls their legal system, seemed like a luxury. A fair bit of torture in my future seemed a given, because obviously I might have hidden explosives elsewhere or had an accomplice. I realized that the passport division at the airport doesn't get to hear the ins and outs of every crime for which they have to detain people, but given that mine had been on the news non-stop since it happened, and would cause three days of national mourning, you'd think they'd make the connection, and at least be very keen to get first crack at me. There was none of that, though. But that didn't occur to me that first night, when I thought I'd never again see my wife, my son, and my sister or indeed any of my loved ones. 
If there had been any feasible way to kill myself in that cell, I'd have done so. I know you can, in theory, bang your head on a wall until the internal bleeding kills you, but that requires a level of determination I simply do not possess.'